Well, good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm wearing a Tiffin University tie. Uh, they are the Tiffin Dragons, and this Saturday they will be holding a special virtual graduation ceremony, which is creative, innovative, uh, so congratulations to all the graduates. And by the way, Ohio Legislator Sandra Williams uh, from Cleveland, State Senator for the 11th District, graduated from Tiffin, as did our Tax Commissioner Jeff McLean. So go Dragons. Also want to say uh, happy birthday uh, to Frank Migalozzi, uh, tr who is the Trumbull County Health Commissioner. And so happy birthday to Frank. We take a moment uh, to thank our teachers and educators who are finding really new and innovative ways to engage their students. Uh, teachers are finding ways to encourage all kinds of learning and expression uh, during this uh, different, different time. In Akron Public Schools, they're asking their students to express their experiences and feelings with art or poetry. We have a picture coming up. There we go. Wow. We're in this together. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Takia Primus Blackman, an eighth grader at Paul Litchfield Community Learning Center, created this drawing. So congratulations uh, to her. She certainly is quite an artist. And she is right. We are all in this together. I want to thank her for sharing this with us and for all the students out there who are using their art to be uh, creative at this different time period in our history. Uh, some good news um, about PPE. When this crisis uh, began, we told you that we're going to do everything that we could to ensure that those on the front lines of this crisis have the personal protective equipment, the PPE that they need. I'm happy to report today that last week uh, we were able to ship 4.1 million pieces of PPE to local EMAs across the state of Ohio. Uh, while not the first shipment, this is the largest one-time distribution of PPP, we think, in the history of Ohio. Uh, the PPE uh, is being distributed locally by county EMAs. And they're, in turn, taking it out to nursing homes, um, jails, congregate living facilities, hospitals, and to first responders. Uh, the shipment included half a million N95 masks, 850,000 face shields, 750,000 surgical-type masks, and 2 million non-medical gloves. So we're very, uh, very happy about that. Uh, and there is more coming. Um, it certainly wasn't easy. Uh, as you know, we are competing in a, in a very uh, volatile uh, and different marketplace uh, with other states and other countries for this critical equipment. Uh, because of the coordinated effort among the Department of Administrative Services, Jobs Ohio, Department of Health, and Ohio EMA, we were able to secure this PPE and then send it out to our local communities. We will continue uh, to distribute PPE to the local EMAs uh, when we get it in. Uh, we're working on this every single day. Uh, you've heard me say this before, but this virus, uh, unfortunately, is going to be with us for a while. And we need to make sure that we have the PPE that is necessary to protect um, our first responders, our medical folks who are out there who are dealing with this problem every day. Our fundamental strategy uh, remains the same. If we can find this PPE in the marketplace, we're going to buy it. And if we can't buy it, we're going to see if it can be made in Ohio. And we're having some good success uh, with Ohio companies who are making the PPE, and we want to thank them. Uh, this really, uh, their response has really strengthened uh, our ability to protect our protectors. And so I want to thank all the companies uh, that are making the PPE in the state of Ohio. We're going to use technology and innovation uh, to identify ways to make the supplies that we have last. 
uh, as we have talked about before, Battelle uh, here in central Ohio is doing this right now, sterilizing, ma sterilizing masks for our health care workers. What this means is a mask then can be used up to 20 times. Uh, so that is really stretching the use of these masks. Uh, as we move into this reopening process, as we try to get Ohio businesses back moving forward, uh, we must make sure uh, that we have strong supply chains of PPE so we can continue to fight this virus as we move forward. Uh, we look forward to sharing more information on our PP efforts uh, in the days ahead. We have an announcement now for law enforcement uh, grants that are now available. Uh, the new normal that we find ourselves in today is certainly challenging for all of us. And that includes those in our criminal justice system who must adapt to meet the need for social distancing. Local authorities have worked in new ways to safely carry out their duties and provide much needed support to victims of crime during this pandemic. nearly $16 million in grant funding available to help. This funding was awarded to our Ohio Office of Criminal Justice Services as part of the CARES Act, the Federal CARES Act. OCJS is now ready to accept grant funding applications from local law enforcement, probation and parole offices, local courts, victim service providers, and adult juvenile and community correction agencies. Uh, with this federal funding, agencies will be able to take measures to help prevent, prepare for, and respond to the spread of COVID-19. It can be used for things including, but not limited to the following, cleaning supplies and PPE, overtime costs, new technology for virtual court hearings, um, inmate medical needs, and supplies for COVID-19 monitoring and testing in our local jails. And these are just some of the ways that this money can be used. Uh, we know that this funding will be especially useful for victim service agencies, such as domestic violence shelters. They're having challenges making enough space for social distancing. Uh, this money also can be used for alternative housing, such as hotel or motel rooms for survivors of violence who need to be quarantined away from their homes due to safety concerns. So as you can see, the money is fairly flexible and we would encourage different agencies to apply for it. Uh, agencies may apply for up to 12 months of funding and there is no local match that is required. Due to the unique, na unique nature of COVID-19, uh, Ohio OCJS has not set a deadline for funding requests. And there is no cap, but we do recommend that agencies apply as soon as possible as this money may run out. For more information, please visit ocjs.ohio.gov. That's ocjs.ohio.gov. Well, yesterday I was asked about graduation, and I know I have uh, uh, caused some confusion around the state. Uh, we did get calls of people who are happy, but we also got calls of people who were, were confused. And so let me, uh, let me try to clarify that today. Um, as I said yesterday, as a father of eight, grandfather of 24, uh, Fran and I know about graduations. We know how important they are. Uh, they're occasions of great joy for a family, pride, and it's a way for families to celebrate the accomplishments of their seniors who are graduating. Uh, we fully understand what an important rite of passage that this is. Um, due to the infectious, uh, infectiousness of COVID-19, uh, this year, of course, everything has to be different. And I wanna start by sharing with you something that our son-in-law, uh, Bill Darling, wrote. Uh, he is a track and cross-country coach at Thomas Worthington High School. Uh, he was a runner in high school and college himself. Uh, he understands from his own experience and from his own children how important these activities are for our students. Um, graduation is one of those things that means so very much to students and to families. And so I want to share a portion of something that, that Bill wrote to his 
track team uh, just a few days ago. I'll quote from part of it. And Bill writes, there is a song making the rounds these days that was written by my good friend Eric Nesda called True Heroes. In it he sings, true heroes are measured by what they give away. In the spring of 2020, for you seniors, you gave up a lot, Bill continues. You gave up most of your last semester of high school. You gave up normal graduation, grad parties, and prom. And you gave up your last track season. It would be far better to look at not what was taken away from you, but what you gave. You gave it up to save the lives of your fellow Ohioans. You gave it up knowing that in all likelihood, you may have been fine, but they, others, would have been in peril. In these next few years, I ask you to look around your table, keep your eyes up in your community, see them, know that there are people who will be with us for years to come, people who are so precious and so valuable. They will be here. They will be here because of you, what you have given away. And certainly Bill is, is very, very right. When we look at whether or not to hold a graduation ceremony, uh, social distancing and keeping social distance practices must be first and foremost. Mass gatherings simply cannot be held for this reason or for any other. Now, I have asked the Ohio Department of Education and the Ohio Department of Health to come together to issue guidance for local schools and health departments to follow. And the, this is a summary, and they will have up on their webpage shortly the full text so that schools and parents can take a look at it. But this is a summary. First and most preferred is a virtual graduation, a virtual graduation ceremony done through Internet platforms. And we know that many schools are doing that and are very excited about that. Second, Second, in preference, would be a drive-in type of ceremony where a student would drive to a designated location at a designated time to get his or her diploma. Third, third in preference, would be an event with 10 people or less at a time who are and remain socially distanced where a graduate can receive his or her diploma. And again, they go into more details, and that will be put up online shortly. Ohio has 612 school districts. Each school district needs to work with their local health department to make sure that their plan is in accordance with public health guidelines to deal with this pandemic. Of equal concern are graduation parties. Uh, and I know uh, through our experience with, with our children uh, that graduation parties are a big part of the celebration. Um, and they've become, at least during my lifetime, uh, a lot more important. Uh, that kids go from graduation party to graduation party. Um, this is tough this year. And I would ask people to remember uh, because the graduation parties can pose as much risk or more risk, frankly, than a graduation. Uh, remember that our order prohibits gatherings of more than 10 people at a time. While it's time to graduate, it's not the time to have a gra graduation party. That will have to wait. I understand how hard this is for the class of 2020. Uh, it's not how you envisioned it, not how your parents envisioned it, not how anyone envisioned it. Uh, but I am confident that our schools will be resourceful and creative in how they can honor the class of 2020. Again, we have posted this guidance on our webpage at coronavirus.ohio.gov. That's the normal 
place to look, coronavirus.ohio.gov. Uh, I'm going to now ask uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, to talk uh, and to try to clarify, and he will clarify, um, the issue in regard to um, face coverings. John? Thank you, Governor. Uh, yes, I had not intended to be here today because I was going to be working on the, uh, the guidance on restaurants and on personal care and some others, but, but we have received a lot of questions uh, about what the, what the uh, requirements will be for face coverings as it relates to customers and to the workplace. And so we wanted to be clear about what those are today and to make sure, to give you a little color to how this came about. First of all, I'm gonna say this to you. You have a governor that listens. He tries to get the best advice from everybody. That's what we try to do. Uh, and as best as you can try to get advice from everybody, there's always gonna be an exception. And when we put the business group together, they, there were 20 of them, and they were unanimous in saying, that face covering should be required for customers and for employees. But we also learned, as soon as that was announced, that there were a lot of other circumstances where a customer or a business found those policies impractical. And so we have worked to clarify the, as best we can on how you should implement this as a business and, a, and as a customer. And let me start with this. Number one. First of all, for Ohioans, when you are a customer in an Ohio business, you should wear a face covering. You should do that. But you are not required to wear a face covering. You should do it. You're not required to do it. And why do we say we should? Is because it's, it's out of mutual respect for one another. This is, a, this is a virus that you can carry and you don't know. We want to protect employees. We want to protect customers. Everybody should do it, but you're not required to do it uh, as an Ohioan, as a customer in a store. So let's now move on to employers and employees. And I'll go slow through this so that you'll have a chance to digest exactly what I'm saying. Face coverings are required while you are on the job. So face coverings are required while you're on the job with exceptions for employers and employees under the following conditions. When an employee in a particular position is prohibited by law or regulation from wearing a face covering while on the job. So there are laws and regulations that prohibit this and that would be an exception. Wearing a face covering on the job is against documented industry best practices. When wearing a face covering is not advisable for health purposes. When, if wearing a face covering, it is a violation of the company's safety policies. Uh, when an employee is sitting, in alone, sitting alone in an enclosed workspace. So if you're, uh, on the, if you're in a business, you're in an enclosed workspace, there's nobody else around, you don't need to wear a face covering. And when there is a practical reason a face covering cannot be worn by an employee, a practical reason, meaning, for example, as we had people call in and say they work under extreme heat conditions, that the cloth mask would be wet in, you know, two minutes if I, if I had to wear it. That's a practical uh, exception. Um, uh, another case in a manufacturing facility where there needs to be a clear line of communication was one example that was provided to us where it could create a safety concern because employees who are handling heavy equipment can't hear one another. These are all, uh, these are all um, exceptions for employers and employees. And if you believe you qualify for one of these exceptions, then your business, if you believe that your business or an employee qualifies for these exceptions, you must provide written justification upon request. And, and let, me, let me be clear about this. What, what our goal has always been is to be firm in that we know that we protect each other when we wear these masks. But we also want to be reasonable. Uh, it, it's, 
and it's a very difficult thing to account for every circumstance in the mask wearing guidance. Ohioans, when we came into this in the original stay at home order, were reasonable and practical and, and followed the rules, and we have seen the health benefits of doing that. And we, as we issue these, this new guidance, we hope that the same thing happens, frankly, because we want you to comply not because it's a government mandate. We want you to comply because you care about each other. And as a, as a practical matter, the faster we get through this, the faster we get on to phase two and phase three. And when we do these things, the social distancing, the disinfecting, the wearing of masks, it, it drops those numbers. We move on to the next phase and life can be, begin to look more like it used to. And um, it's gonna be a while, but it's gonna take that team effort again. We're just appealing to you in doing this, that we're all in this together. These are the guidelines that are, that are, that are mandated with exceptions. And there's also best practices that even go above and beyond this if, if, if a business can do it, which many businesses already are. So we're trying to be firm and reasonable and we hope that this clarification today um, will provide that guidance and it will be available. Um, uh, I know that the communications team will get this out to everybody. Governor? Thanks, John. Dr. Acton. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and start with the data. All right, so um, today we now have 17,303 cases are reported in Ohio an increase of 534 cases over the last 24 hours reported. Um, we do have um, hospitalizations that have trended slightly up in the last 24 hours. It's something we'll continue to watch. Our deaths right now in Ohio are at 937 uh, people that we have lost in Ohio. Next slide. And our data remains pretty consistent. We have tested 128,000 people in the state of Ohio. Uh, next slide, Eric. Thank you. And we can see our trends. Um, right now, our cases going slightly up, but again, mostly plateaued. Our deaths have increased significantly. A lot of that, of uh, what we're seeing, remember, deaths aren't reported. Um, deaths that occurred in the last 24 hours. It's deaths that we've gotten data on. And our death numbers will increase actually over months. Um, this date today, um, in April 29th, um, the people who actually died today, um, we'll be learning about them in many weeks and even months to come. And so that's why death data can be a little bit tricky to interpret. Um, hospitalizations. Um, we did go up. I did talk to some of our uh, big centers in Ohio. They have seen a slight uptick of hospitalizations, not ICU admissions, however, and you can see ICU admissions today a little lower. And remember, once again, that getting the disease starts within the next two weeks, you might need to go to the hospital. Within the next week or so, you might get admitted or need to be in the ICU. And again, deaths following. So this data, you know, always needs good interpretation. I would say, Governor, what we're still seeing, just a very even thing over time. Um, next, I think that would be it for today. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about the masks as well. Um, I want to acknowledge um, just everything that everyone has said and the beautiful artwork we saw as well. You know, we, there are people for health reasons that cannot wear a mask. There are folks with disabilities, folks with sensitivity issues. And we definitely, um, it's not typically recommended under the age of two. Um, and, and with everything we have done in this, we have really appealed to you because in the layering of all these defenses we can have collectively, we're always aiming at most of us doing the right thing. We are never going to be able to get everyone to do the exact right thing. Um, but I want us to think about this for a moment and that when we all do this collectively, we are 
protecting each other. I've been looking at data of deaths, actually, in countries that did or didn't institute sort of the measures we've taken over the last month and a half to two. And even looking around the country, what Ohioans did together drastically decreased our illness and it drastically decreased our deaths compared to many places around the world. And we didn't do that just by ordering it. We did it by all of us doing it together. We have to think about the fact that when I see you wearing this, I know you're not just, you're really not doing this for you. You're doing it for me. You might be doing it for my child who's immunocompromised. You might be doing it for my parent. And every time I see someone doing this, that's what I see. I see that sort of nod, that high five to each other about what we are doing collectively. And it will take all of us doing this together. I see a culture change happening. I see people taking sort of what are some hard and difficult things and joining together in a, in a solidarity. This is a team sport, Ohio. This is all of us collectively. Our outcomes going forward, our ability to get around and move around and do more, the more we do this, the sooner we get out of it and the more people that will live with us to be at that next Thanksgiving table, that next graduation. And to those of you who are graduating this year, the class of 2020, I'm already seeing the advice we'll be putting out with the Department of Education is some of the most creative things I'll ever see. The virtual graduations, the drive through celebrations, the wedding I just saw pictures of in the newspaper where people went out in the middle of the street and the neighbors were banging out from every house, drawing hearts on the sidewalks, joining in together is a wedding that will be a forever memory for that couple. And it is not like any wedding. It's not the one they planned, but it's the one that they'll really remember at this point in time. What did we remember that we did during this time to help each other? And 2020, when you have that five-year reunion and you're all together, you will be that class that actually lived through this together and have that memory. So it's a new memory and it's a special memory. So Ohio, let's, let's do this together. Thank you. Governor. I do have um, information right before we get to questions. Um, this will not take long, but this is... Social Security Administration has asked us to make this announcement. Uh, if you get Supplemental Security Income, SSI, uh, you will get your $1,200 economic impact payment from the IRS automatically. You do not have to do anything. Uh, but if you get SSI, have not filed a tax return, and you have an eligible child, you must act now to get $500 per child in addition to your $1,200 payment. Let me read that again. But if you get SSI, have not filed a tax return, and you have an eligible child, you must act now to get $500 per child in addition to your $1,200 payment. By May 5, uh, go to the IRS non-filer web form available at irs.gov, that's irs.gov, to give information about your children. Uh, if you miss the May 5 deadline, uh, please go to irs.gov, irs.gov, for further information. And for information how, on how Social Security continues to serve the public during this critical time, go to ssa.gov slash coronavirus. All right, ready for questions. Governor, this is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. My question today is for Dr. Amy Acton. Dr. Acton, I'm wondering why uh, we're not reporting the data on how many people have recovered from this. We are trying to get our hands around that. We're working with our colleagues in other states. There hasn't been um, to date, a landed upon recovery definition. And so uh, in addition to a lot of other data, we're really trying to figure out the best way to report that. Um, we know, for instance, that we haven't tested a lot of the mildly ill people, so I have no way of knowing the people who have stayed at home, had this, or, or been asymptomatic and had this, and who have recovered. 
We are working with our hospitals, though. For people who have been hospitalized, we have a date, a line in the sand, at least that we know they had the disease. And so one could assume maybe 14 days after that they have recovered. However, some people go longer. Some people, um, a family member of ours was in the ICU, you know, for over 20 days, um, certainly more than the 14 days, and is still recovering. So that, that definition of recovered has been tricky. It's something we will eventually have and we'll eventually have better data on, but I just want you to know we're working on that. It's not something we're hiding. It's just a complex thing to quantify. So thank you. Kevin Landers, WBNS 10 TV. My question is for the governor. Um, my question regards masks. Uh, it created quite a firestorm yesterday on social media, both for and against masks during your comments yesterday. And I spoke to a business owner who says that by not mandatory, man, making mandatory masks for customers, you're basically forcing businesses to be both law enforcement and enforcer, and they say that's simply not fair. And they want to know why mandatory is not in the best interest of everyone as opposed to a recommendation, which is basically on an honor system. And if you've been to a grocery store lately, you can see people simply aren't wearing masks as they should. Thank you. Uh, we talked about that yesterday. Um, I understand that. We think that is the best practice. I will again encourage every Ohioan who goes into a store to wear a mask. But what became apparent to me um, in, in a, quickly uh, after we'd announced that mandatory for people going into stores, that this was something that a significant number of Ohioans just simply would not accept. Um, and that was my judgment that this was a bridge too far. We'd ask Ohioans to do a lot of different things. Uh, we've recommended a lot of different things, uh, but this one was one that a significant number of Ohioans felt the government telling them to put on a mask before they go into a store was offensive, uh, and we heard a lot about it. Now, the fact that we heard a lot about it is, is not determinative, but my judgment was that this was simply not acceptable to people. Um, and we can make suggestions. Uh, we've made a lot of orders, and I've not hesitated to do that. Uh, but this was one where we felt um, that if we could continue to talk about the importance of the mask, uh, the importance of facial covering, uh, that people will start doing this. And I am convinced that Ohioans will do this. Uh, I think when Ohioans understand, and many do, uh, that when you wear a mask, you're doing this for someone else, um, you're not really doing it for yourself, that it is protection for that other person. And that the more all of us can wear masks when we are in together, uh, the better off that we, we are. John, I can anything? I can add a little bit of that. Actually, the pushback that I received from businesses was exactly the opposite. What they were saying is that you were making a mandate, a government mandate, that you were forcing the business to have to to implement on the customer, and and so under this policy, a business can mandate uh, face coverings for their customers. But the pushback that we got from businesses was that. You're asking us to be the police for your policy, uh, and they didn't like that. Uh, and and so again, what I believe we have, what we have uh, confirmed through this, is that we want to make it firm that there are there are there are good standards, but we want to be reasonable as to how a business implements this. Uh, and as we've experienced from the first round of this, from the very beginning, businesses and people have worked this out very well. Uh, they have been compliant, 
and, and we fully expect that that will continue to happen. We, we have to be civil with one another. We, we have to, to work to respect one another. Uh, that is the, the best way for all of us to get through this. Um, yeah, uh, Kevin, I just wanted to address your question from the medical uh, point of view. Um, I've been early on um, when I looked at the science, and I had looked at it actually before the Surgeon General and the CDC came out. Um, I talked to some scientists uh, around the world and learned that this was being effective in other countries. So I presented the idea of universal, was the word I was using, masking, as another Swiss cheese layer that's proven effective. Great article in Nature just came out. Um, so there's evidence. Um, the CDC is recommending it. They're not mandating it, they're recommending it. Um, what I looked at, and it's a, lot, it's a lot like other public health things, that when you first start out, it's really about behavior change and culture change. So when I've traveled globally, again, as a global health professor in other cultures, this is the norm. You would be seen as impolite to be coughing and hacking on people. But we have to get there together as a culture. We have to, this is a very big behavioral change for us. In addition, there are a lot of disparities that I quickly noticed. As much as we think everyone has a bandana or anyone could wear a mask or a scarf, and most people could, I'm finding that there are pockets of people that this doesn't necessarily have the same access. So I'm looking at some inequity issues as well. Eventually, in our culture, perhaps wearing masks will be more like something like smoking, that we've come to say, you know, it's not okay. You can smoke, that's your choice, but you can't, I can't be a secondary hand smoke receiver in a public place. That might eventually be a culture change we get to. Um, it might be like wearing a seatbelt. We know some people don't wear their seatbelts. Um, but if most people do, many lives will be saved. I see it this way. This is the beginning of that social contract with each other. Um, this is absolutely not just saving my life. In fact, it's much more saving your life. When I follow traffic laws, and you see this in countries where there aren't any, you know, we save lives by following these things. So this is something we're going to lean into very heavily. We're going to have lots of campaigns about it, and we're going to reach as many people. But in the end, at home, I'm telling you, if, if you want to do this, Join me in this. Don your mask. Don your cape. Let's save lives together. Thank you. This question is for Dr. Acton, Jim Province with the Toledo Blade. Um, and I want to continue along the lines of something you talked about just a few minutes ago. Um, you've talked about the fact that the vast majority of Ohioans remain vulnerable to this disease and that they're, they're still going to be at risk whenever we reopen government. A vaccine is still probably a year away. Given the trends we are now seeing, would it be better, as some other countries have done, to more widely open Ohio's economy with some precautions in place, at least as it pertains to the younger, less risky populations? Would that generate herd immunity faster? Right. Well, herd immunity, and for those of you who might not know that term, um, and we don't tend to think of ourselves as a herd, as humans, but we are. And, you know, even things like immunization, we do it so that, for instance, with measles or other diseases, if 90% of us are vaccinated, there are people in our population who can't get vaccinated. Kids who have diseases, who have cancer, adults who have that. But when most of us do something, when most of us do it, it protects those of us who can't make that choice. And I think that's, that's really true in a lot of things. Now, in per pertaining to COVID, um, that has been an argument that has been bandied about quite a bit. If you remember, England tried to go that route originally. They quickly changed course in about a week and a half when they realized that there were just way too many, there's too little we knew and way too many people getting sick and dying. So it's not just who dies, but who gets very sick and has lifelong consequences. Um, Boris Johnson just came out having recovered from this, you know, very much did not want to put in those things and now is begging his country to take these measures very seriously. Um, this is not a minor thing, COVID. 
And while we see that there are predilections to certain people, the elderly dying from it, there are many, many deaths of all age groups. Not only that, but we're learning more and more about how sick people of all age groups are getting. And we are learning that people are having strokes and other kinds of things that we didn't understand in the beginning. So this is still a very dangerous disease and we really want to minimize the spread until we have more treatments and more things in place. Um, and also, quite honestly, there still will be a threat if we spike too much of overwhelming our healthcare workers and our systems. So, you know, this really is finding, and again, I, I give our governor and our team so much credit for navigating this unknown time. It's a very narrow, narrow walk through balancing all these effect, effects on our health and well-being and on our businesses and on our nursing homes and on our hospitals. It's really, really navigating a very tight razor's edge to maximize the best outcomes for all, all those things. So I don't think a wide open. Um, we have many, unfortunately in Ohio, many people who meet those risk factors um, from things as simple as obesity. Um, we do have some bad health outcomes. Um, if I could, um, there was a, an editorial in the paper, in the dispatch actually, this weekend by Reverend John Edgar. I don't know if people know, he, he runs something called uh, Community Development for All People. It's, it's an outreach and a ministry that helps, and one of the big things they do are food banks and a drive through um, all, all people's fresh market for food. And as we know, all our social services are struggling right now. But he said, you know, some of us talk about this being a war on a virus. But he also said the caring people and the things we are doing collectively to help each other right now through these very hard choices and times are pig pilgrimage toward mutuality and wellness. So wellness is an expansive concept. And there really isn't a safe way to say out there that our young are safe, go out there, when we know that there are many that won't be. And, it's, and so we have to walk this collectively. We have workers who are greeters at Costco's who are elderly. We have young people who have underlying health problems that go to work. And so as employers and as doctors and as people, we're trying to help all of us get through this. Thank you. Hello, my question is for the governor. This is Ben Garbrick with ABC6 and Fox 28 in Columbus. Uh, governor, my question is about child care. We have, we've heard from a lot of people who are eager to get back to work, but they have children who are home from school or children that are usually in child care, but those facilities are closed. Yesterday, you expressed sympathy for people in that position. You also explained why it might be problematic to have children coming together and potentially spreading the virus and taking it home. But as we're trying to get the economy back going, what can the state do for those people who would love to go back to work when it's possible, but they just don't have anywhere to take their children? Thank you for the question. I, I know that a lot of people are asking that question. Uh, we are working with the legislature. Uh, we're putting a, a, a working group together uh, to take a look at child care uh, and see how we can get people um, so that they can work. Uh, put their children in, 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 a, in a safe place where the children can, can learn. Uh, but as we talked about yesterday and we talked about before, one of the, the challenge is as we open up the economy, as we move forward, and we know child care is an integral part today uh, of people being able to work, but we also know child care has, that congregate setting has the same risk as schools do. Uh, and there's a reason that school is, is, is not in session. And as we talked about yesterday, is bringing people together, young kids together, uh, who may all be just fine, but one may be carrying the COVID-19 virus, uh, and then all the kids are carrying it, and then they go back to their respective families. And so it, it is a significant aspect of the spread of, of, of COVID-19. And so that is the challenge. That's why we've not been able to, you know, did not feel that that was where we could start. Um, just like we've felt we have not been able to go back, back to school because this is a very significant spreader. But we also know 
uh, as we start back that we, we have to phase this in uh, and we have to provide help to people. So it, it is a work in progress. A lot is going on in the month will be going on and in, in, as we prepare for, for the month of May. Uh, we've got a lot of different things. As we said, we're going, um, you know, with manufacturing. Uh, we're going to the hospitals on, on Friday. Um, on, the, on the 12th of May, we're going, going with retail. Uh, we're beginning discussions, working group on restaurants. So a lot of things are rolling out. Um, and the child care, we know we have to address that as well. But what we want to do, we do not want to be in a situation where we are moving so fast that we're spreading. And in three weeks, when we see the results, uh, we've got to roll things back. And that's just not where we want to be. So it, it, we got to be cautious as we go about this. Thank you. Adrian Robbins with NBC4. And my question's for the governor. Um, you've talked about the importance that consumers have confidence that they're going to be safe when they head back to stores. Do you think that the state has done enough to instill that confidence, especially when we're not mandating masks? And do you worry at all about the damage we could be doing to businesses that start to open up, but no customers come out because they don't feel safe? Uh, very, very good question. Um, you know, I would invite our viewers to, to look at the protocols that we have put forth. I'm going to ask the Lieutenant Governor a moment to talk about these because he, he worked on these. But the businesses today will be safer from any kind of infectious disease than they've ever been before. Uh, there are protocols in place uh, as, we, as we move back towards opening everything up that have never been in place in the history of this country before. Uh, they've been thought out. Uh, they are uh, significant. They involve s s social distancing. They involve sanitation. They involve monitoring every employee who comes in every single day to see the health of that employee. Uh, never before in the history of this country ha have we done this with, with every, every business. John, you want to add anything? To yeah, sure. Sure, Governor. I, look, you know, there, there, are two, there are two issues here. What is the right public policy and what is the right business policy? And our, our responsibility is to come up with the right public policy to provide for both the health and the economic well-being of the state. And so Dr. Acton and I often have these conversations, and, and the governor is, is, you know, in the heart of every single one of them. What's the best public policy? And that's what we are articulating. But businesses are going to take different approaches trying to capture customers in a new world. Uh, and so many of them are doing innovating thing, innovative things online. And many of them are doing curb, you know, curbside services. Uh, others, uh, I've talked to businesses, are going to be promoting themselves as the safest place to go do whatever it is that they sell because they're going to talk about all the things that they do to make their business safe for their customers. And I'm sure that that will create both marketing and, and, and customer attraction opportunities for them which we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, just like with graduations, it's amazing the innovativeness that you see out there uh, among businesses who are figuring out how to live in, in these times. And so, uh, but building confidence in the marketplace is important. That was why, that was actually why the, the 20 businesses that were on our uh, group uh, that, are, that advised the governor and, and me and Dr. Acton on this, that's why they said face coverings, because they thought that, that, the, that in doing it, it would create that safer environment where people would feel more comfortable. Because just because a business is open, if you don't have customers, if you don't have a market, as many of them are, many of them are allowed to be open, but they're not open because they don't have a, a marketplace right now. So your question is very good in the sense that how we build confidence is important. That's what all of this is about. It's about building that confidence amongst the public. Uh, and I always say, when I'm looking at these things, I always say, what about me? Would I feel comfortable working there? Would I feel comfortable going out and doing this? And the policies that we're making, you know, for me, pass that standard, but it's going to be different. If you're younger, look, statistically speaking, 
the disease has less impact on you than if you're older and if you have, uh, if you have other health issues. So we're all going to have to make our own judgments. But, but what we have done from a public policy is, is being firm and reasonable, trying to protect health, the health of people in the economy, and businesses are going to go above and beyond this in most cases to try to build that confidence. We have set very, t very tough standards that they have to follow, but in, in addition to that, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor said, it is, in, it is a merger uh, of the best practices and the best business practices because these companies have to be able to ensure that their workers, people who they're trying to hire, people who they're trying to get to come in and work, they, those workers have to feel a confidence that, that they are in fact safe. Uh, just as a retail business has to make sure its employees are safe and feel safe and they can recruit people to come in uh, as the same way with, with customers. So they, they, they have an economic incentive, uh, good business practice to do this, as well as the, uh, the mandates that we have, we have set down. This is Jackie Borchert from the Cincinnati Enquirer. My question is for Dr. Acton. Um, Dr. Acton, it's been a while since uh, you talked about serological testing. And given that we've, since then we've seen some studies out of New York and California kind of trying to nail down the prevalence of the, of the disease, um, I'm wondering how wide, widespread is serological testing in Ohio today, and is the state collecting that data or conducting its own prevalence study? Yes, thank you for asking. So again, the science of serologic testing is evolving, but I can tell you, I was on the phone call last night. We have a work group on testing overall that's led by past governors um, Taft and Celeste, and and just some of the most. It was one of these conversations, I wish you know everyone could hear them because they were just so thoughtful. Some of the best researchers talking about this. We do have some innovative research going on right here in the state to get that good serologic testing, uh, but it's still an evolving science. And I won't go into all the nuances. Someday I'll do a little 101 on serologic testing. But you know we're still trying to get, um, and the lieutenant governor has been fighting hard to get us uh, those 1,000 uh, tests from Celex. Um, that will allow us to do that. But we're very much hoping, we've had the science, we have the study set, and we're hoping to begin our prevalence study this Monday. Um, it'll be the first of many studies on prevalence here in Ohio, um, and we're very excited about that. You've maybe seen the results from some of the first studies done in New York City, uh, fascinating results, and we're gonna do that very same work here in Ohio. Um, and that will be ongoing. We'll do larger and larger sample sizes over time. But I feel very good about that. And once you start it, it takes about two to three weeks to do the, the um, study and get the results. We also have a very fascinating survey underway, uh, piggyback, piggybacking off of an already existing uh, Medicaid survey that's out in the community. So we can learn more about people's symptoms and risk factors. So we're doing some innovative studies, uh, the like of which we've never had the opportunity to do in partnership with amazing universities here in Ohio, as well as uh, Battelle. Um, I do want to take one moment to um, just add to what um, the governor and lieutenant governor said. I have felt all along that, and I think we really have to avoid this going forward, that there are these sort of false narratives out there that pit things like business is doing well in the economy versus health. And you know, in a complex world, people are always saying what's bad about this time. I think one of the things that are gonna be great about this time that we have learned, I hope, as a lesson, is that um, the world can be very complex and nuanced and, um, and, that, and that we shouldn't get caught in zero-sum games. We, as a team, are constantly fighting to find the win-win solutions. And I think we should really hold ourselves to that and aim higher. We've been aggressive on the way in. We're being aggressive going forward. We are not accepting that people have to die to have a good economy or this or that. We are really trying to maximize our well-being. And if you think about this, we, 11.7 million Ohioans, are the business owners and we're the customers and where were the workers, and where are the, the nursing home people. We're in the nursing home, and we're the workers there, and we're in the prison, and we're the workers there. This, this, we cannot accept leaving anyone behind. These are not, we don't have to have a zero-sum game. Let us innovate so we all win together. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Ben Schwartz with WCPO. Um, Governor DeWine, we've been hearing from a lot of people who say that ever since word got out about things beginning to start to open back up, they've immediately started seeing people completely ignoring social distancing guidelines. Um, I wanna know if you have a recommendation for what Ohioans who are taking social distancing seriously, what they can do if they see something like that. Well, Ben, that's a that's a real good question, uh, and I, you know, I referenced that the other day when I looked at the, uh, the all the newspaper headlines around the state, and it was talking about opening up uh, and announcements. And uh, my concern was that people wouldn't read the fine print or wouldn't read the story, but would look at the headline and see things are opening up, um, and they are opening up. We're trying to get get this economy moving moving forward but at the same time we have to be just exceedingly careful uh, the virus is still very much out there it's not gone away it's not going to go away for a while uh, we're going to do some very innovative things with testing uh, and tracing uh, to go after it and, and ba basically uh, stop it from going from one person to other but th the way it travels uh, is still the same it goes it, when you group we have people grouping together uh, one can spread it to the other. And I guess the thing I would ask our, our, our fellow citizens to remember is even if you're not sick, even if you don't feel bad, you could be carrying it. Uh, there's a lot about this virus we don't know, and we continue to, to, to learn. And as Dr. Acton has, has tells me, uh, certain things we don't know, but it would appear that you can have this and that there are a significant number of people that could be having it uh, and they never know it. And so they go out and they intermix with a bunch of other people and they could be spreading it to, you know, uh, a, a bunch of people. So we, we've, we've got to, we've got to have the discipline um, as we start back and get jobs opening up, which is what everybody wants. At the same time, we can't be foolish. At the same time, we can't lose our discipline about the social distancing, and we've got to be careful. It's a, there's a reason that we did not really change the stay-at-home order. There's a reason that we did not change uh, the number of people that could gather together. It, it's, it's 10 people. Um, we, we kept those, and, and that was a signal, we hope, to, to people across the state of Ohio that they have to continue to, to be careful. Dr. Acton, anything on that? No, I, I think a good way to think about this is an ever-expanding essentialness to our lives. Like, we are trying to expand out and regain the things that, that make our lives whole and, and increase our productivity and keep things maximally going. And so by going in this very measured way, in partnership with all sectors, um, we're, we're gonna keep finding those sweet spots. And it, it is a sweet spot, I said, this razor's edge of maximizing all the things that we can do. And so I think for those of us, you know, to keep, keep living our lives um, in this healthier at home, that we still really want to decrease our spread and be conscious of the fact that we can't spread this with each, out each other, it takes a person to spread it to another person. And we're gonna to try to do more and more things, but still honoring the fact that that is true. And it does take perseverance. It takes a certain amount of patience. Um, but if we do it well, we'll get there faster and we'll do it better and we'll save more people in the process. So I really think there is a sweet spot. Everyone in the world is trying to find it. I'm very amazed at what Ohio is doing I think we're, we could be leaders in finding it. So thank you. I had something to that because, because every day I get calls, when's this going to be over? And I keep reminding folks, it's going to be over when we defeat it, which means isolating it and not spreading it because that's the only way you kill it. And the more we socially, you know, the more we comply, the more we socially distance, the more we wear masks, the more we wash our hands, the more that we do this, the faster we get through it. We get to move on to the next phases of, of recovery. And so uh, I just ask, look, I come from a team sports background. It is a team game. It literally is. You, you, everybody has to do their role 
for the team to win. And I think the win, win, what win means is getting this behind us and moving on. And, and so the more we do this, the faster we get through it. Marty Sladen, Ohio Capital Journal. Uh, Governor Dewan, I have a question for you. Uh, we're talking about reopening workplaces on a day when deaths are going up. And as you do so, have you given much thought to uh, low-income workers, particularly service workers who want, might be elderly, might have compromised health, might have kids at home, um, who are faced with the choice between going back to work or staying home and losing their uh, workman's compensation benefits? Um, is there any consideration to uh, creating some way for people to get waivers? Well, I've thought about them a lot. Um, you know, that is a that is a great a great concern uh, that someone who is because of their age, because of their health situation, is certainly very very much um, at risk. Um, I don't have a great a, a great solution. Uh, I do know I was had a conversation with my friend. Uh, John and my mutual friend Albert Ratner in, in Cleveland uh, and I also talked talk to, to others in Cleveland about this and in other communities about foundations and others coming together to try to figure out the people who are most at risk uh, who have to work or feel they have to work figuring out you know how we can help them um, so I don't have the answer uh, today, but it is it. Yes, it, it weighs very heavily on me because there are people who should not be taking that risk, but they feel that they have to, and I fully understand that because of their economic situation. Because they're the one, the family who earns the money, they have to work uh, to to bring that in. So I don't have a good answer today, but it's certainly something that we we think a lot about, and it concerns me a lot. This is Danny Eldridge with Hannah News Service. Uh, my question is for the governor. Um, can, can you talk about what kind of liability uh, businesses may have if they don't require customers to wear masks and if their employees get sick? Uh, I'm not going to play lawyer today. Uh, um, so, I, no, I don't, I don't have a comment about that. That would be a... You know, people should obviously talk talk to their their own lawyer about that. Um, you know, this would be an area, uh, I would suspect, an area of the law that is not really defined. Uh, and my guess is, I don't know this, but my guess is there aren't too many court cases directly on point about about that. So again, under our order, any business has the right to require anybody walking in that store uh, to have, have a facial covering. Uh, we just did not mandate that they had to do that. But they have the right to do that, and they could and they can do that if they, if they wish to do that. Would you say it's good advice to uh, mandate those if you want to avoid lawsuits? Well, I don't, again, I don't, I don't know about the, the legal side of it. I, I would be uh, talking about something that I've not studied or not looked up or not been advised about. Uh, we, we know uh, from a health point of view uh, that having people wear masks coming in, a facial covering is, is, is the best thing. Uh, again, I'm the eternal optimist, as my wife will tell you, um, and I'm hoping uh, that as we move, continue to move through this, that people will understand that it is, uh, unless they have a physical reason for not wearing one, and some people do, uh, but if they don't have a physical reason, that putting on a facial covering, something like, like this, it doesn't have to be as pretty as this, or my wife Fran made this, but just putting something so you're covering your, your mouth and your, and your nose is a protection for everybody that you come, you come in contact with. And I, I think we're, you know, we're on a journey through this. This is uncharted. None of us have ever been here before. 
but I, I think as we go through it, and the evidence is, is clear, that when you put this on, you're, you're not so much protecting yourself as you're protecting others. And when everybody does it, you, you, you layer on, as Dr. Acton said, another layer of the Swiss cheese, and uh, you cover some holes and you give more, more protection. So I'm hoping uh, that more and more people will, will do this. Uh, we just came, I just came to the conclusion that mandating it in a retail setting was something that Ohioans just weren't ready uh, for the government to tell them to do it. But what I hope is that their own, their own sense uh, of right, what they should do will tell them to do it. That's what I'm hoping. Governor, if I, if I could add a little bit to that, because the question is about masks and understand that that there are legal reasons that businesses can't require masks. Um, there are there are literally in some food settings that it's that having a cloth mask is is not allowable. Uh, it's not an industry best practice. It's uh, the individual employee has a health reason that they don't want to wear a mask or can't wear a mask, and you you really can't ask them directly uh, about that because you're you. you uh, uh, because of uh, health rules and privacy rules. Um, so there, there are reasons, there are legal reasons that you can't require a mask, and that's why, you know, as the governor's point, this, there, this is not tested. Uh, these are best practices. These are things that we're requiring because we know that they will help in the aggregate, but an individual setting is different from business to business. Hi, Governor. Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television, State House News Bureau. I want to talk about face masks. Um, you've mentioned that, you know, on Monday after you announced the face mask mandate that the reversal kind of came because of public input. But what about in the last 24 hours, have you heard a backlash from people who were in favor of the mask mandate? Uh, what do you tell them? And does the input from the anti-mask mandate side weigh more than the people who were for a mask mandate? Uh, you're right, Andy. I've heard from everybody, it seems like, about this. Uh, people feel very, very strongly about it, uh, at least the ones I've, I've heard from. Um, this was not an easy uh, decision. Uh, we want people to wear that can, unless there's a reason they can't. We want them to wear the facial uh, covering. Uh, and look, in making these decisions, we don't take a poll. We don't see how many people send an email to me. We don't see how many people call me. Uh, but, you know, I've lived my whole life in Ohio. I'm in contact with average Ohioans every single day. Now, not in person, but um, in other ways today. And we, put, we have asked Ohioans to do a laundry list of things. Uh, and we mandate a bunch of things, and they've done them. By and large, they've done them. Uh, but when we got to the government telling an Ohioan, if you're going to walk into a retail establishment, we're going to compel you to put on a facial covering, it was clear to me, uh, and should have been clear to me before I made the, 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 the mandate, uh, that that was just too far for, and that there is a significant number of Ohioans who were offended by it, uh, thought this was government overreach. Um, as we go through this, we've gotten this far. We've saved the lives we've saved, not because of what I have mandated or Dr. Acton has mandated, but because of what Ohioans have done. And if we lose that feeling that Ohioans and their willingness to do some tough things and to do some things that they've never done before, none of us have ever done before, if we lose that willingness, uh, then it will be disaster. Uh, we will lose many, many more lives. Uh, our business will not come back. Um, so we can't lose that sense of Here's what we're all in this together, and here's what we've got to do. Uh, and, and so my decision uh, was that that was clearly too far. But again, 
I'm hoping, I'm the optimist, that Ohioans will study this, look at this, and say to themselves, I'm going to the store, I'm going to the grocery store, I'm going to the jewelry store, whatever. It is really not a, a great inconvenience when, when I get out of my car to put that facial covering on. Uh, and, and I'm convinced that as we move forward, more and more Ohioans will, will do that. Hi, Governor. It's uh, Andrew Welsh Huggins with the Associated Press. Um, I know we're supposed to hear from the DRC director at some point, um, and I recognize you talked about that huge shipment of PPE earlier today. Um, but we are hearing, hearing a lot of concerns from uh, corrections officers in the state prisons that they themselves don't have enough PPE still. And, um, you know, they're wearing the same mask over and over. Um, what are your concerns about uh, the, these state employees in this very dangerous congregate setting, not having enough equipment themselves, and what do you think might be done about it? Uh, this is difficult circumstances. Uh, it certainly is difficult circumstances for a state employee who is working in, in our prisons today. Uh, we're doing everything we can to get PPE into them. I've made it very clear to our team we need to go after this, the PPE, and that our prisons are a top priority. I've also made it clear to our team that testing uh, is a top priority. The reason that you are seeing numbers out of our prisons uh, that are much, much higher uh, than, than other places is because we made a decision to go test everybody. Um, and when we've got a hot spot, we, we move in and we've surged testing in. But the director will be here tomorrow um, and I'm gonna to defer to the director uh, who deals with this on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, um, and she will be able to fully explain exactly what we're doing in regard to PPE, but not only PPE, uh, all the other things that, that we're doing in regard to our, our, our prisons. So if, you, if, if, if I could beg off one more day, she's, going, she's the expert. Uh, she'll be in here, and, and she'll, she'll talk about it. She'll be on Skype. She won't be in here, but she'll be on Skype tomorrow. Thank you. This is Laura Hancock from cleveland.com. I have a question about cleaning for Dr. Acton. Um, Lysol, disinfectant wipes, that kind of stuff, it's not really readily available. Um, people have asked me about this. Um, will soap and water suffice, being that it doesn't kill off as effectively as like all that stuff that Dr. Weir was talking about last week? Um, you know, surface, killing stuff on surfaces. Can you talk a little bit about this since we have a lack of a lot of these surface cleaning products? Yes, so I, I want to advise folks to go to our website, coronavirus.ohio.gov, where we do have cleaning guidance. And there's some um, other sources that you can go in more detail, especially if you're in a sort of a business or hospital setting, there are different things, or EPA, you know, um, cleaning things. Once again, we have to use everything we have at our disposal and fight the war with the tools we have. Soap and water are still a very, very effective thing, doing it more often. As Dr. Ware said, even when we clean something with one of those excellent cleaners, you know, we're talking about microscopic, things we cannot see with our eye. And when I wipe down something, I've probably killed maybe 99 point something percent of them, but a few are gonna get away, they're gonna start to multiply. So it's the frequency of cleaning and it's the layering of all these things. So the more often I do it, that next swipe I get more of it and the ones that were starting to multiply. Um, and I'm saying this as a person who has not cleaned her house, being, being a little busy lately. So I'm just imagining myself at home trying to do this. But it is this like doing our very best with the tools we have as often as possible. And for very specific guidance, please go to coronavirus.ohio.gov. And yes, there are shortages of things everywhere. And that's why we have to keep fighting together. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Randy Ludlow with the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, the state today raced right past 800 deaths, didn't even stop in the 800s, went over 900. Uh, cases uh, went up more than 500. Our numbers seem to be tracking the wrong way. Uh, yet I hear from people 
who cannot find masks, who can't locate cleaning supplies, uh, they don't have a sewing machine or aren't handy, can't make their own. Uh, I hear from dental hygienists who are terrified they're going back to work Friday and they don't have the right PPE. What can be done to make PPE more available to the general public? Well, Randy, anybody who works in a medical uh, situation, for example, in a dentist's office, obviously needs to have the, the PPE. Um, there are normal uh, supply lines uh, that hospitals, that doctors, that dentists have. Now, the, the problem has been that <laughs> these normal supply lines during this pandemic are just all messed up. Um, and we've seen, you, you know, we've seen kind of the Wild West over in, Ch in China when people are trying to buy stuff. And you've seen people who are uh, brokers and, and middlemen who are br taking it out and almost putting it up for auction. And I can tell you more, more horror stories. So it, it is a problem. Uh, we are trying to do absolutely everything that we can. And we announced earlier at the, this press conference the things that we are, are doing and we're not bringing these in and holding on to them. Uh, you know, we're holding on some in case there's a surge somewhere, but we're getting these out just as fast as we can uh, out, out into the communities. Uh, so it is a national problem. Uh, it is not unique to Ohio. Uh, we have put the best people we can. We are spending the money uh, when we can locate this stuff. We are making some of it in the state of Ohio. Um, so we are very aggressive about it. But you're right, it, it does, for some people, uh, remain a problem. And it is a, a big, big concern to us, and it motivates my team every single day. Every day, when, we, when I start my day, uh, I get a report on the status of the PPE and what we have been able to obtain. Now, again, there are other supply lines. Normally, the state is not out purchasing this and distributing it. Usually, whatever group that needs it is doing that themselves, but the supply lines are messed up, and, and we, we understand that. And so we're trying to do anything that we can to, to help, and we're going to continue to do it. It is a top priority. Governor, can I add one, one point to that? Um, under, our, un, under the rules, if you cannot p supply the safety equipment and comply with the standards, then you cannot open. So that's a really important part to remember about all of this. Just add, I'm not the expert on this, uh, Randy, uh, but uh, there's a lot of ways to make facial covering. Uh, and a facial covering is obviously not, not um, uh, the N95 mask. It's not, you know, it, it is facial covering is basically, as Dr. Acton has explained, to protect not me, but o other people. But, but I've seen people take all kinds of different things and just literally put it around and they're covering their nose, they're, co they're covering their, their face. So um, I know a lot of people are making them and coming up with some great, great designs, but it, it's also I've seen some people do it in a very, very simple way. Governor, this is Laura Bischoff, Dayton Daily News. I'm the last question. Um, I wanted to ask you about colleges. Um, Urbana University is closing. Um, University of Dayton is furloughing 450 workers and laying off others. How do you expect Ohio colleges and universities are going to weather this pandemic, um, and what will they look like going forward? Uh, Laura, I don't know. Uh, it is a great concern. Uh, I wear a tie of one of our great universities every, every day, or most every day. Uh, one of the great assets that we have in Ohio uh, is our universities and our colleges, both private and, and, and public. Uh, it was already a different time, uh, particularly for the smaller schools, uh, as the demographics have not been in, in their favor. Um, going through this pandemic, it creates additional problems. So uh, I'm fully, fully aware of that. Um, that don't, have, don't have a great answer, but I know that, you know, this is a, this is a time when people need to rally around their, their alma mater, their college, and, and, and help them out because it's a very difficult time. And continuing to speak about colleges, uh, 
This year's graduation uh, will be different. Uh, Tiffin University, as I said, is planning on celebrating with a virtual commencement ceremony online this Saturday, uh, May 2 at 2 p.m. As part of the virtual ceremony, they will be featuring a virtual choir, uh, a recording made by their students singing the song, World on Our Shoulders. The song features the lyric, I'm here standing with you, here standing with me, standing with the world on our shoulders. The song has a great message and it's an example of the creativity that can be part and is a part of the graduation ceremonies for the class of 2020. So let's take a listen as we close. That was great. Tiffin Dragons. We'll see you all tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Thank you.